Now, needless to say, these researchers were completely taken aback by these findings. They did not expect to see this, but they were forced by the data to conclude, can anyone learn to be good at anything they want? Or is talent, like having a knack for math or a gift for language required? Our evidence suggests, Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is called An Astonishing Regularity in Student Learning Rate by Codinger and Colleagues. Now I think this is hands down the most important paper from 2023 because it speaks directly to a major dispute within the learning sciences. So in short, this paper stems from a 2002 National Academy of Sciences report which states high ability learners learn at a more rapid rate than other students. Now believe it or not, this statement was made with zero evidence. No one has actually looked at learning rates, but it seems self-evident, right? We've all seen some students shooting ahead while others are lagging behind. But here's the issue. If we assume that learning is biological, so for our purposes, let's assume learning is instantiated by some physical change within the nervous system. And if we also assume that all human beings have the same basic biology, then all human beings should learn at the same rate, with one striking caveat which we'll see towards the end of this video. But that aside, all people should learn at the same pace, and that's the ongoing tension within the field. We don't know how to reconcile this. Well, along comes this paper. These researchers fully believed in that idea that high ability students learn at a faster clip than everyone else. So they designed a strict digital learning tool which allowed them to track each student's explicit practice, or as they called it, learning opportunities. So here's how it would all work. Students would all undergo an explicit lesson in a classroom on a specific topic. Then they would use this digital system to deliberately practice specific skills or units of knowledge from that topic. They weren't allowed to practice in any other way, and they would use this digital tool until they achieved mastery. So in this case, mastery was defined as getting 80% correct consistently with a specific skill or unit of knowledge. Now by parsing it out this way, these researchers were able to establish initial knowledge, how much did they learn after that first lesson, explicit practice opportunities, how many times did they re-engage with this material, and by extension, they were then able to track learning rate. How did each practice session change their knowledge or performance? Now what makes this paper so good is these researchers ran this study with thousands of students over dozens of schools for over 11 years. They have been running this study since 2013, so they have literally millions of data points they're using. And what were the results? Well, before we tuck in, let's take a look at our possible outcomes. We've got four. So here's a graph. On this side, we're gonna take a look at performance from 0% to 100% pure mastery. And on this axis, we're gonna take a look at explicit practice sessions or opportunities for learning. So we could have all students starting with the same initial knowledge, but learning at different rates, which would look like this. Or we could have all kids starting with the same initial knowledge and learning at the same rate, which would look like this. We could also have all kids starting with different initial knowledge and learning at different rates, and this is exactly what the researchers thought they would find, or we could have all kids starting with different initial knowledge but learning at the same rate, which would look like this. So what did they find? Two things. First, they found that everyone started with different initial knowledge. In fact, after that first lecture, knowledge typically ranged between 55 and 75% on performance, so about a 20% variance amongst initial learning. And the second thing they found had to do then with learning rates. Let me show you a few of these graphs. Here are the learning rates for high school geometry. Here they are for fractions. Here they are for college statistics. Here are a few in the domain of science. Here are some in the domain of language. In basically every instance, regardless of where students started, their rate of learning was nearly identical. In fact, they estimated learning rate difference to be less than 1% between individuals. That's basically nothing. Now, needless to say, these researchers were completely taken aback by these findings. They did not expect to see this, but they were forced by the data to conclude, can anyone learn to be good at anything they want? Or is talent, like having a knack for math or a gift for language required? Our evidence suggests that given favorable learning conditions for deliberate practice, and given the learner invests effort in sufficient learning opportunities, indeed anyone can learn anything they want. This is far and away my favorite sentence written in any scientific article last year. Now at this point in the video I typically say, let's bring this back to us, what does this mean for teachers? But I think that quote says everything we need to know. But as I said earlier, there are three caveats that I think it's worth us kind of diving into, so let's quickly do that. Number one is here, I wanna go back to that quote, 
An operative phrase here is favorable learning conditions. Now we all know not every learning and teaching condition is the same. In fact, in this experiment, the researchers were able to highly control the deliberate practice to make sure every kid experienced identical learning situations. Except for that very first lecture, each kid experienced different teaching conditions. The fact that after the initial learning lesson, kids still differed by about 20% in their performance shows that not all learning situations are equal. But what defines favorable learning conditions. My feeling is that's probably going to vary context to context and situation by situation. So this just gives us good reason to draw from other people within our context, to start documenting our own work, looking at our own impact and sharing that with colleagues so we can determine what favorable learning conditions looks like in our particular context. Now the second caveat concerns covert activation. As we learned in an earlier video, the human brain doesn't differentiate between what we think and what we do. So long as we think something, the brain will change as though we were doing it. That's why mental visualization boosts learning. Now in this experiment, the researchers had enough data to weed through any covert activation and make sure kids were getting identical experiences of practice. Any kid doing his own thing would get washed out in the thousands of other data points. But in reality, it's worth us recognizing this. Some of our kids will look like they're excelling compared to everyone else, and it could be because they're thinking more about the topic. After class, there's a chance 99% of our kids will not think about what we just taught them unless it's on homework or a quiz. But there is that 1% who will do nothing but think about it. And when they come back into our classroom the next day and they're shooting so much higher than everyone else, it's not that they had a better learning rate, it's that they put in much more deliberate practice. We simply didn't see it occurring. So that's something to think about. And the last big caveat is this. It's a concept called metaplasticity. Now we have a way of measuring how receptive a brain is to new information. How much does it change after input and how long does it take to revert back to normal? And in almost everyone we put through this protocol shows about 30 minutes of metaplasticity. That's how long it takes the brain to initially change, then go back to homeostasis. The fact that we all have the same basic metaplasticity is most likely the mechanism of why we all learn at the same rate. But there are two groups that act differently. One group of individuals have extreme metaplasticity. It takes them anywhere from 90 minutes to three hours to return back to normal. And another group is hypoplastic. It takes them only about five minutes before their brain goes back to normal. That first group characterizes autism spectrum disorder. And that second group characterizes schizophrenia. So it's possible the learning rates in these two groups, autism and schizophrenia, might be different than everyone else. Unfortunately, that was not looked at in this paper. So that's something we still gotta consider. But as for the other learning disorders, ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, so long as the input registers, there's no data that their metaplasticity is different than everyone else, so we would expect the same learning rate. But again, the caveat is, so long as that input registers. If you've got attentional problems and you can't focus longer than 30 seconds, then that likely wouldn't constitute a favorable learning condition and we wouldn't expect the same outcome. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. As I said, that was my favorite paper from last year. If you like what you saw, you can give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. That'll make sure more people get a chance to see this video. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you all at the next one.